it this time. And number one, I'm feeling a little sick, so I apologize for the raspy voice. But nevertheless, I still am always committed to get this done, regardless how I feel. But uh, the, the, I'm going to change the framework th this time around. We're going we're gonna to try this for some time, and we'll see how it goes. Number one, we're always going to start off with any sort of relevant headline articles of the week. I want to go over my thoughts as somebody that does quite a bit of business here in the Bay Area as to what you know my feedback is when it comes to these different articles. We'll do that every week. So it's always going to be the latest inf information as to what people might be writing about or maybe hearing. Number two, after that, we're going to go over. I want to share stories about how uh, I met different clients, but also how I've helped people buy their houses. Uh, we're going to go over those houses. I'm going to give you that story as well. I think it's going to be very cool because that's what I love about this business. I mean, there's so many people that I get to help, uh, so many amazing people that I get to meet through this line of work. And sure, there's tons of ups and downs. Um, it's not an easy thing. I work uh, a ton, but uh, I think it's always great for people to understand the thought process, um, the stories of these individuals and how they got to the house. And the last but not least, we're going to cover the market updates of the week. So I always go over different counties. I share with you the data so that you can visually see for yourself. And I also give you some of my thoughts when I see these numbers as well. So lots to cover today. Um, different framework, but let's get going. And as usual, you can, you're can you always welcome to chi uh, chime, chime in live. I, I, I answer and respond to all uh, questions throughout and um and and uh, it's always an interactive session apologies for the last one actually it was a different quote but let's go into the very first article sri campus in menlo park may become a big mixed use neighborhood modern offices homes could replace existing sri menlo park complex so this is a fundamental thing that most cities are having this issue to deal with they have a lot of corporate space it could be industrial it could be warehouses it could be old office buildings. And they're all, as you can imagine, back in the day, especially with SRI, I mean, these could be decades old, maybe like in the 70s, 80s. And so whatever their zoning was back then is completely different than what it is now. We need a lot more housing, a lot more density. So do not be surprised as you see a lot of these places rezone things to be really quite interesting. So it'd be really, really cool to see this uh, happening, especially if areas do need less office space, but then they can use that opportunity to create much more housing. Um, especially every city has a different mandate in terms of uh, you know how much housing they need to build over the next decade. That is a mandate from the state level. But as you can imagine, places like Menlo Park, places like Palo Alto, these very high uh, end expensive places, I think where would you build if you were them, right? You have like the wetlands, you can't really build there. You have all sorts of space already in use. You can't tear down single family homes. So it really provides a limitation of practically almost only the spaces that are office spaces. Now, given they're in prime locations, there's going to be plenty of builders that would be happy to take that opportunity to rezone and redevelop the areas. But it's something to be mindful when it comes to these projects. But don't be surprised. You should see a lot of these happening throughout the weeks or sorry, throughout the months, throughout the years. Is pandemic rent pricing already over? Here's where San Francisco stands now. For renters in San Francisco and across the U.S., pandemic pricing is increasingly a thing of the past, a new report says. There is without a doubt that things have continued to uh, rebound back. Now, a lot of these are being projections in terms of how they, uh, how they correspond in terms of what things will likely happen. Now, it is without a doubt, and you see for yourself, I'm renting out some homes for my clients in terms of leases. There's still quite a bit of activity. Now, prices have dropped slightly still over the previous years, but nothing dramatic, especially in, in the larger the home, the larger the unit, not dramatic at all. Like, for example, if you want to rent a single family house, it probably has not declined. It probably has actually increased over the year. Townhomes have declined a little bit. Condos have de declined more. But now as people are coming back, there are a lot of companies coming back that some that you may not know of. For example, I have a, uh, an introduction made yesterday. Lyft is going back to the office as well for at least three days a week in San Francisco. So you have a lot of companies coming back as well. A general mandate for most is going to be September. We're seeing a lot of people return back to 
uh, the Bay Area and San Francisco will be a benefactor as people come back, especially if you think about San Francisco. Most people have fleed San Francisco over the year for various different reasons. Number one, it was, you know, why pay that kind of amount when there's n literally nothing to do? You're literally in a box all day. So why pay that amount? Nothing was open. Like literally it was one of the most locked down places in the entire country. So there was just no motivation for anybody to live there. But as you may all know, check out the parks again. Check out the restaurants. Check out the bars. Everything is fully open. Everything is packed. I mean, literally packed everywhere. So if you thought it was bad now, everybody is ready to spend. Everybody's ready to go out. And with that in mind, people will want to flock back to the city of San Francisco. This week, I helped the client buy a place in San Francisco, or buy a condo there. So, um, you're, I'm, and I'm helping a lot of other clients buy in SF as we speak, which was not the case for the entire of all of last year. But that is very, that is changing very quickly. And I will show you the data that reflects that momentarily. Now, when, it, when we deal with this kind of market, the thing that is very interesting is you have some clients, which are, you know, fortunately, a lot of clients of mine that have the long term thinking. At the end of the day, while things will get hot, things will get cool. Generally, homes will go up about 6% a year on average in the Bay Area over an extended period of time. That has been the data of the last four decades. Now, some people may be spooked, right? Because things have gone a lot, a lot, a lot faster than in recent times. So it, at the end of the day, it depends on the individual, but people should not lose focus as to why did you even look for a house to begin with? Many people forget that because they always fall into the trap at the end of the day of just being a renter. They say, you know what? It's easy to be a renter, which it is. Of course, that's the, that's the whole trap of it. It's quote unquote less, which it is. It's less headache, less work, less of a process. It's easy to get a rental. Um, there's nothing that is, it was never difficult to get a rental. So a lot of people kind of make that mistake. And then they lock themselves for a year later. And then they sometimes get further and further out of reach. So at the end of the day, you want to consult with your realtor and going over options and available strategies. At the end of the day this year, I've already helped 25 families buy a house. It is certainly not impossible. It's certainly very practical, but you do need to level set expectations as to where would this go? What is Where would this go relative to what other homes have sold for, irrespective of the list price? I think a lot of people fall into that mistake. They think, oh, it's I'm paying 20% over list. Look at this clickbait article here. Offers 20% over asking or expected. All this kind of BS here. The reality is if it's 20% over asking, it's because they artificially priced the home very low to drive a lot of people in. So you have these kind of clickbait articles that have scared a lot of people. But when you look at the charts itself, you can see, you can disregard the June figure because it's only four days. It's not relative. But if you look at this growth over the last couple of months, you can see it was not 20% over previously. Now, if it's 20% over something that sold six months ago, then yes, that is very realistic. But if you're comparing with the data over the last one or two months, it's not that kind of increase. So fundamentally, people just need to understand and be educated. And that's why I've been very successful of helping a lot of buyers in this competitive market of being educated as to what things will, what is a list price, which is an artificial number, what will things likely appraise for, which is also a different number. So you need to factor in that delta potentially. So you're, the realtor is very important to give you that idea as to what the risk is for not appraising and what that dollar amount is. So you have just in case for funds and then what it will probably sell for. So at least you get the best uh, odds and best chances. But I bring this up because it's without a doubt, fewer people are uh, in the market. So it's an interesting divide. You have people that are you know, long-term thinking, because at the end of the day, do you think prices will not keep rising? You see all these different things, right? You see the, the shortage of new homes. You see how hard it is to build new homes. You see more and more people continue to move back into the Bay Area. Like you tell me, I mean, maybe things will slow down, but it doesn't mean it'll still be increasing though. So you're still paying a higher amount down the road. So do you want to do that? That's my question for those individuals. Number two, when it comes to renters, do you still want to pay another year of rent? I mean, rent is not cheap by any means. Just because it's cheaper than a house doesn't mean it's cheap. Like, for example, most people will pay between three to six thousand dollars a month on a home here in the Bay Area. Do the math. I mean, that's between thirty-six to seventy-two thousand dollars a year that you're you're wasting just because you think the market is too hot and you kind of give up. So, it is what it is. I mean, I've seen a person myself, and I try to educate as much as I can. And at the end of the day, people can make the decisions um, themselves. 
Kevin, thanks for uh, tuning in and thanks for uh, tuning in actually weekly. How do cities handle zoning and rezoning? How much say do the citizens of the cities have versus what the city wants to generate more taxes for them? This is a very uh, great question. It's a very difficult thing to answer. Typically what happens is that cities tend to have long-term plans, right? They have these kind of, uh, if you look at every city website, they have some sort of like plan for the next decade. Now it could have been done a few years ago, but the idea is that there's a decade long plan. So quite frankly, most areas have already been classified and been rezoned and zoned in different ways. Now, what makes it very complicated? There are mandates and there are you know, requirements from the state to say, look, places, every city needs to build X amount of housing, right? And that could be dictated for, from different means, could be political, could be based off a of size, whatever it may be, could be based off of how close they are to a transit stop. There's all these other variables, but the idea is that every city is required technically to build a certain amount of housing a year or over the course of time. Now, the question though is like, how accountable do these cities have to be? That's very uh, difficult to say, you know, what can the state do? They can say, you know what, we won't give you any state funding. The question is, does the city need those state fundings? I don't know, right? Take a look at like Palo Alto, Menlo Park, just drive by like, how many new homes have you seen in those areas in the last five, 10 years? Right? I mean, there's the answer is not a whole lot. And and but why is that? Uh, several different reasons. Number one, there is just, there's just no land for them to build. The rezoning and, and tearing down places re also requires big investors to go through that project, right? The investors are not stupid. They want to look at the numbers and be like, okay, how much can I possibly earn? Does this make sense? And if you think about it. There's somebody that owns that building and owns that land too. So you they, they need to make it work because that now that owner of that land also knows how much is worth because it's now rezoned. So it's way more complicated than just it got rezoned because now it needs to be a very clear mutual win, which it is high level. The pie is bigger now because if you can build more density, it is more it is bigger. But the question is, how do you structure that deal? And like what is the tolerance of both sides to make it happen? So it's very, very difficult um, for a lot of these projects. Uh, to give you an idea, this week I was able to meet with the agent, crazy story, meet with the agent that helped the family d build uh, and develop Communications Hills. Anyone that lives in the Bay Area knows how massive the hill is Right. I mean, now their goal is to make, I think, 3000 units, something like that. They made only uh, half of that so far. They're, they're almost done with phase two and they're going to have like uh, industrial space, which is pretty massive, about 25,000 square foot of space. They're going to have um, a mixed use space of like office rentals as their next phase. But that's a couple of years out. But like that project started in discussion with the city back in the 90s, I think actually probably the 80s, 80s and 90s. It took two decades for them to decide what they're going to be doing in the plan before they even started building. So you see these things that are very difficult, number one, very complicated. And um, there's just too many, there's so many parts. Now, the reason why Communications Hills was able to do what they did is because the owners owned it outright, right? So they have the patience to last forever. But if you were buying, you know, a commercial space and you have a bunch of stakeholders, then that gets very, uh, very interesting, right? Because now you have a different stakeholders to report to. There's different things. Your, your thinking long term is completely different. So that's why there's, there's all sorts of complexity, all, all sorts of variables when it comes to this. At the same time, a lot of citizens, for sure, there is a massive, uh, not movement, but massive saying, which is NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard. And that's even more prevalent in more expensive areas. For whatever reason, the people that live in rich areas and more expensive areas, uh, they have actually more time. If you actually think about it, they actually have more time than those that are, you know, maybe uh, hardworking all day because they're so busy working, doing their work. So they have less time to uh, do political actions or uh, make a voice with the city and things like that. So places like Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Cupertino, Los Altos, Los Gatos. I mean, think about those areas, right? Very uh, much higher end properties. Um, not much construction, right? Not much has changed, quite frankly, in those areas. Uh, it's very, very difficult to build there. And a lot of it has to do with the political pressures. Because think about this, who votes you in for the city? It's the citizens. 
right? And so it's a it's a very difficult thing to change. Um, and unless there unless the state can truly push people, um, that's really the only way. But it's very difficult for that to happen too. So then you might have like different lawsuits between the state and the cities, which is not uncommon to see. But um, you know that's that's something that happens too. Okay, so let's uh, go with the second segment. So the second segment that I want to provide is actually related to some of the deals that I closed in the last week. So I want to talk about these different stories, talk about these journeys. This one is 780 Batista Drive in San Jose. This is a property out in, guess where? Communications Hills. It's actually one of the uh, previous spots, the older areas of Communications Hills. This family um, works at Apple, amazing family. And... Um, you know, they, their goal, they want to get out of a condo. They have a, they have a young baby and they're expecting another. So as, as many people, I think you'll see that as a years, there is a lot of COVID babies, um, that has happening. What does that mean also for housing? There's going to be a whole lot more people that will continue to make moves for bigger space, right? So it's going to be interesting to see throughout the year that is very likely to continue to happen. Um, we're going to see a lot more movement, quite frankly, because a lot of births are happening uh, much, much higher than, than the normal rate. I can probably assure that. I would love to see that data come out as, uh, as this continues to move forward. But you know, they needed more space. They're upgrading, I think, from a two-bedroom condo to now a four-bedroom, 2,300-square-foot space. This is the largest, one of the largest units in uh, the area. So congratulations to them. They ultimately want a larger space. And for, fortunately for this, this was not all very competitive. Um, you know, it was on the market for some time, given it's one of the largest units, largest townhomes, at least, in the area of Communications Hill. Uh, it was not too difficult to get. And what's crazy was that they were about to give up. I think they were about to say, like, hey, we're going to look for one or two more weeks, weekends. If we can't get it, we're just going to give up and just stick with our condo. Um, and you can't imagine how many times this has happened. Like, so many times... You just kind of keep pushing. I mean, don't take it personally, right? You're not the only bidder. This is this is not a super easy environment, but it's not an overly difficult environment. It's kind of neutral. So you want to keep your emotions neutral as you go through the search. And of course, the realtor will be able to give you guidance and kind of be your therapist, quite frankly. You don't want to, you don't want to jump off the, the cliff and just give up, especially if you have not found something in a month. I mean, that's you know, I know everybody wants to kind of move in fast and fill, fill in needs, but at the same time, if it doesn't work, as long as you're doing progress, as long as you're learning, as long as there's, uh, as I mentioned, progress, then you'll do very well and you will find the house sooner than later. I can guarantee that. Uh, absolutely guarantee that. Okay, the next thing is uh, another client moved in this week. So the Linden is finally open. I think they're actually the... Uh, it was pretty funny. I think they're the, literally the first um, owners to move in. Now, Linda, I think maybe has sold maybe over 30%, something by now, uh, potentially even more. But then they're, fi they're finally able to be moved in. They're going to have this pretty amazing patio space that's a shared. It's not necessarily rooftop because it's on the fourth floor, but it's a nice open space that overlooks, has a great view. So I certainly am uh, going to visit there as soon as they start throwing parties out there. But this is a really cool spot because the Linden is actually in South San Francisco. And uh, that area in South San Francisco is walkable to a lot of the small shops, lots of restaurants and things uh, there. It's also pretty close to the uh, stations. So the tr public transit to be able to get to the city or go uh, to the South Bay. I think this is a pretty overlooked area. I think people should definitely check it out. If you or anyone you know wants a new construction condo, this is a good spot for that. I think you might you might be pleasantly surprised. Uh, so the, And these are also move-ins. So if you have anyone interested, just feel free to let me know. I can give you my thoughts. I can represent you as a buyer and help you with uh, you know, this move. But great spot. Congratulations to them. I believe their story was they were renting a place. We looked at several different condos throughout. Um, but it didn't take too long. We were only looking at new construction condos. You know, the, the pro and con is that there's not a whole lot of new construction. Um, so the search is actually fairly limited when it comes to at least new construction in like kind of the peninsula side. So it's a very good, great win for them. I'm happy for them. They just moved in, I think, um, last week, uh, last Friday, and uh, they're super thrilled. And they have an amazing view of the hills. So uh, major congrats to them. You are welcome, Kevin. Thanks for tuning in. All right, let's take a look at the data itself. So San Mateo County, looks like this week, I and I suspect we're going to continue to probably see lower numbers. 
generally the springtime is the busiest time. And you can see there's quite a bit of new listings that come on every week. Uh, as, as the weeks progress through the summer, I suspect a little bit of a drop off. We shouldn't have these high numbers. These numbers are very high. These are higher than pre COVID. So do not make that mistake that we have a limited amount of new listings. That is not the case. Now you can disregard the figures I have for June, but at least I want to show that, you know, it's completely up to date, but you can see the trends over the months. You can see continue to push higher. I would say about a 5% increase a month is what we have seen. So it's very important to understand what has other homes have sold for in the recent time and add that buffer. But it also means that your appraisal risk will depend as well as to what other homes have sold for and when they have sold. So it's very important to understand that, especially in San Mateo County, which is a very competitive county, as I mentioned, as people are clearly moving back uh, to the area. Uh, the other thing next is Santa Clara County. Santa Clara County, as you can see, also a drop in new listings. Now, I think this has a combination as well. Um, this data was pulled as of, it was it was Memorial Day weekend last weekend. So this is, um, so it's a data pulled from that. So there is gonna be a little bit less potentially for the holidays. But either way, I think as we enter in summer, you'll, you'll encounter the same thing. But as you can see, the figures, you know, may hit an all-time record high, pretty substantial increase. I suspect that this growth will continue to happen. I suspect it will probably be a little bit slower, um, but I still suspect that the growth will continue to happen. So you can see just the median prices. The median price, sale price of a single family house in uh, Santa Clara County now is roughly around 165-ish, 1.65 million. And you can see even condos and townhomes have picked up quite a bit over the over the months. You know, this, this has to do with several factors. People are giving up from their dreams and aspirations of initially starting off with single family. And there's nothing wrong with starting off with a condo and townhome. That is how a lot of people get started with their search. Look at Alameda County. I'm gonna start putting some data as well. You can see there's 516 new listings, quite a bit of new listings in, in Alameda County. You can see contingent pending 321 uh, so far. You can see the figures, like I said, disregard the June figures, but you can see that May was a very big, very good positive month for Alameda County. And look at this spike. This spike is pretty strong. So it's one of the areas that has continued to grow and continue to do very well. Now, do I think it's still, it's still gonna be this uh, hot? I suspect it'll probably continue to be this hot uh, for a while as people continue to move outwards to the East Bay. However, I think there's gonna be a big factor by the time that September hits around, and people get to see the traffic again, that there should be an impact to slow the growth. I don't know if it will decline, uh, but I think people will, it will slow. Like I just drove recently to, um, I was meeting with a client because we got in contract for a property in Hayward and traffic is getting pretty bad. Um, it's getting pretty bad again. And so that will be a factor, which a lot of people are not realizing given they have not been out of their house for some time. But as people, more and more people will go back to the office, that will be a, a meaningful impact. Next, let's take a, let's let's actually close off with the last one for today, which is San Francisco. San Francisco um, prices have continued to increase. I mean, take a look at single family houses. So you can cut the clickbait article when it comes to San Francisco of a doomsday. If it was so dooms, why would they be increasing just like every other county in the Bay Area? I mean, take a look at these figures in May. It's, I mean, this is a, a very stellar number for single family houses in uh, San Francisco. So it continues to increase, continues to do very, very well. The caveat though is condos, but condos, as you can see for May, has been the highest it's been for the last basically almost a year, but pretty much match what it was back in July. And I see that myself, there are a lot more activities of my own clients, of people actively looking, of open house traffic, there is a lot more activity, a lot more people going back in. So there are still many opportunities, but don't expect like crazy low ball numbers for these. Um, expect some decline because I looked at the figures. Uh, prices have been relatively flat, I would say the last three years in San Francisco for condos. So it hasn't changed a whole lot, uh, but don't be surprised where you know it's gonna be higher than it was just a few months ago. Um, but it's nothing too crazy uh, out there. Pretty predictable. You have people have a lot of options, but uh, there is certainly a lot more activity that's going back. 
And I'll answer this as a wrap up because um, this will conclude the session. A lot of people are anticipating that the market will cool down after this summer season. What are your thoughts on the sentiment? I think, Kevin, at the end of the day, everyone is hoping and praying. That's my answer to that question. People have always been hoping and praying that things will slow down. A lot of people are, everybody's hoping and praying. And for me personally, I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, you can't, I mean, I work with a lot of buyers. To give you an idea, right now I'm working with at least probably 30, 40 buyers as we speak. And uh, amongst them, like how many people are dropping off? A lot of people have dropped off. Not of the 30, 40, because those are active. But a lot of people, other people have dropped off uh, in general. And so if it does uh, cool down, it's actually going to be better for everybody. right? It's going to be better for me because I don't have to keep uh, telling people, hey, look, stay focused. Stay focused on your goals. Uh, it'll be much more modest. And it'll also be much more predictable as to what we'll go for. However, it is unlikely to happen. I think I will call, I will probably call the counter argument to that. It seems unlikely. I think things may get worse. And here's here's the thesis as why things will get worse, uh, at least for the next year. I think things may get worse for several reasons. Look at new construction. You tell me how much new construction is left for people to absorb. Fortunately, in the past, in the last year, people have been able to take those properties because they were actually a little bit slower if you ask same time last year. But look at all those massive developments. Look at Nuevo, 80% sold out. Santa, those are Santa Clara condo, uh, Santa Clara townhomes and single family. Look at all new construction all over the Bay Area, at least for townhomes and if they're single family. You tell me how much is left. The earliest movement for a majority of those is going to be the, if next year. And that's if they even have any left to sell. And then look at what's coming down the pipe. There's a big gap, right? Look at Communications Hills. They sold out one year in, in advance. What do you think that means now? They will not build anything for the next three years. What do you think that means for now supply? Right, so these are data. This is actual data. This is something that people need to understand. Things may have a very good probability of getting much worse. That's one case. Where's the supply side? Case two, which is the demand side. People are coming back to the Bay Area. Now, there's their choice what they want to do, right? Do they want to rent, which will drive up rent? Or do they want to buy, which will, should drive up buyers, right? So you have that going on too. So I don't, you know, who knows if things will go crazy up, but at the end of the day, it's unlikely that things will decline. Now, I could be completely wrong, right? If interest rates shoot up like crazy, that's... That's the that's the bear case, uh, which is obviously out of our control. That means the economy is also doing well. So that's the tricky part related to that. But when it comes to supply and demand, it's very very difficult to to gauge that and 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 and, and factor that in. But from a supply perspective, it's not looking good. From a demand perspective, it's higher because everybody's moving back because of the offices. So I suspect that it should be a pretty pretty wild still next twelve months. So I'm all in. I'm continuing to to be very bullish about. What's happening? I'm, I'm I'm working as much as I possibly can to help as many people as possible. It's, so it's been very intense. But uh, appreciate all the questions you're tuning in. And of course, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to reach out. These are live, so I answer everything in real time. If you're not able to tune in live, you're welcome to leave a comment either on my Facebook page or on YouTube, as I will get back to you with my thoughts too. Hope you enjoyed this uh, episode, engineering a better life today. We'll see you at the next one. Bye now.